Hi, for this video I want to talk about three uh, important properties of the autocorrelation and autocovariance functions. Uh, these are going to build on these definitions and conditions that we've developed in the previous videos, and they're going to be helpful properties for us as we proceed with our analysis of random vibrations later. So the first property that's important is that these functions are symmetric. Okay? And so let's, let's think through why and, and what that means. So the autocorrelation function phi x x at time t and s. All right, so by definition, that was just our shorthand for this expectation, expected value of x at time t and x at time s. Right. But that expectation, the stuff inside the expectation, it doesn't matter what order it's in. Right? That's the same thing as x, expected value of x at time s, x at time t. Right? So we just, we're just plugging in these two things. We just need a joint distribution of x at those two points in time, which is going to not depend on the ordering in which we plug them into this expectation. So that's the same thing as the autocorrelation at x at time s, x at time t. Right. So if we change, if we flip the parameter values and, and put s first and t second, the autocorrelation is going to be unchanged by that, just because of this nature of this expectation form. Okay. Similarly, the autocovariance, that's the same thing, just subtracting off means. And the, again, the means, it doesn't matter what order we multiply those in. So the autocovariance is also symmetric. Okay. And then Further, if, if it's a second moment stationary process, that was the condition that these things are unchanging under shifts in time, then we can say, well, this autocorrelation at time t and s, it right, depends only on the difference in times. So we'll sometimes write this as t minus s instead. We just have to specify that difference in times. And because we do that a lot, um, we will shorten that rather than trying to write t minus s every time. We'll just write it as tau, where tau equals t minus s. And that's a, that's a um, variable form that we're going to use often. So let me underline that, and, and we'll use this tau frequently in the future when we have second moment stationary processes. Okay, so um, so if that's the case, that this autocorrelation depends only on tau, the difference in time, and if I flip t and s in the ordering and it, change, it leaves my answer unchanged, well, s minus t is going to be the negative of t minus s. So that means that the autocorrelation at time lag tau has to be equal to the autocorrelation at time lag minus tau. Okay. So if I go forward in time tau or I go backward in time tau, the autocorrelation in those two cases has to be equal to each other because of the expectation form of this um, process. And similarly, the autocovariance has to be equal at tau and minus tau if it's a second moment stationary process. Okay, so there's some, some symmetry that comes out of this. Um, another property that's important is that these functions have to be non-negative definite. So let's write out the mathematical condition for this. So we'll say for any set of time indices, t1, t2, dot, 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 up to tn, and any function h of t, so some arbitrary function, h that varies as function of t, we have to have the following condition. The double summation um, i equals 1 to n, j equals 1 to n, of the autocorrelation at time ti tj times h at time ti, h at time tj. So that double summation has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Um, so uh, a couple notes on this. So we can think about, you know, it says that there's kind of this double summation that makes it a little harder to think about what's going on in here. We could simplify it down 
a lot to just the n equals one case. All right, what's, what's this saying then? So it's saying the autocorrelation function at time t1, t1 times h, this function at time t1 squared, that has to be greater than or equal to zero. Right, so that's the, the simple version of that um, condition without the summations. Well, this term, no matter what that function h of t1 is, when we square it, it's going to be positive or at least non-negative. So that's not going to prevent us from being greater than or equal to zero. So the only thing that's going to set the sign of this result is this autocorrelation function. Right? So it just says the autocorrelation function at time t1, t1 has to be greater than or equal to zero in order to, to ensure that condition. But the autocorrelation function at time t1, t1, well, let's, let's do this in two steps. Okay, so that's got to be greater than or equal to zero because um, this term here is greater than or equal to zero already. And if the autocorrelation is greater than or equal to zero, that, and, and because it's evaluated at t1 twice, that's the expected value of x at t i or t1 squared. A little tight here. That expected value at, at, of x at t1 squared has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? And that condition should hold, right? So an expectation of a, of a characteristic squared is always going to be non-negative. Okay, so for the n equals 1 case, it makes sense that this would, would uh, hold. Um, the higher order cases, it's a little lot less obvious like why that would be the case. Um, but the, th the, the situation that the reason this is um, important, an important characteristic for us is um, the, for the following. We're going to think about, uh, so if x is an excitation uh, process and um, we're thinking about some process z, which is like a response of a structure. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's consider um, z of t, so that, that could be like a response of a structure, which is equal to a summation of um, i equals 1 to n of h at t i um, x at t i. So, so this would be, we can think of like a Duhamel integral approach to um, getting a response. So, so the x at t i summed over a bunch of points in time, t i could be all of the excitations at times previous to now. And then h at t i could be my impulse response function to say, if I have an excitation at time ti, um, h of t could tell me how much that's causing a response in my structure at time t that I'm interested in. Right? And I could add up all those loads times the impulse response functions to get my response at time t. Okay? And we need the expected value of z of t squared to be positive or to be non-negative as well. And so that condition that z of t squared is, is non-negative um, when, when z of t is based on this functional form is going to relate to this, this broader characteristic up here, this non-negative definiteness. Okay? So that's a way, I'll leave it to you to kind of sort out how those things relate to each other, but there's a hint to kind of get that connection together. Okay, and um, Let's note also that the auto, changing gears a little bit here, the auto covariance that um, kxx ti tj is also non negative definite. Okay, so, so here, this, uh, this term here, we could substitute that in for the auto covariance. Um, and the same formula up there, that same double summation formula would have to hold. Okay. Maybe I'll, yeah, I'll, I won't touch the slide to mess it up further. But uh, you could substitute, you could swap those black underlined terms 
and the double summation would still hold. Okay, so that's non-negative definiteness. That's an important property for us later. And then a final um, property is that this autocorrelation converges uh, when we have a big time lag. So, so let's note this. So I'll say for any process, without a periodic component, um, if we think about this autocorrelation at times t and s, and we take the limit as the absolute value of t minus s goes to infinity, so we take the, the two time indices and we pull them very far apart so that they're infinitely far apart. In the limit, that autocorrelation is going to converge to the mean value of x at time t multiplied by the mean value of x at time s. Okay. So, so we're going we're gonna to kind of lose any sort of correlation uh, or dependence between the process's values um, at those two points in time, as long as there's not a periodic component that persists to infinity. Um, and then the autocorrelation is going to converge in this way. Um, and then similarly, the, um, the limit as the absolute value of t minus s goes to infinity, same limit as before. But that limit applied to the autocovariance, that's going to be zero, because right? the autocovariance is just the autocorrelation minus those two mean terms that the autocorrelation converges to. Okay, so, so visually, what does this mean if, if we look, well, let's look at the autocovariance. We, get, we now have a couple properties that we can use to draw a picture. So if I look at time. T, um, and I plot the auto covariance. And let's do it for s equals zero. So we'll hold s constant at zero, and we'll vary t. So what we'll end up with is an auto covariance function. It could oscillate around a bit, so it's going to be kind of big when t is equal to s. It might kind of vary positive and negative, something like this. It's going to be symmetric, right? We just talked about that a couple slides back. So negative t values are going to give me the same answer as positive t values. I'll go off like that. Um, but even though even if it's oscillating, there's going to be some sort of a convergence over time, and no guarantee on how fast that'll be. But as t minus s gets big, so t since in this case since s is zero t could either get very positive or very negative, that autocovariance function is going to converge to zero eventually. Right? So, so that's the general shape of these autocovariance functions, that whether they oscillate back and forth or they just decay straight to zero. That, that'll depend on the characteristics of the process. And if the process has a true periodic component that persists off to infinity, then we won't get this convergence. But, but if we don't have a periodic component, we'll see autocovariance functions that look something like uh, what I've got plotted there. Okay, so those are some key properties of autocovariance autocorrelation functions. We'll stop this video here.